Okay, so um, I'm going to go through some of the ecological processes that help inform a permaculture design, and there's three of them. There's zonation, there's succession, and there's stratification. So I'll go through each one and just describe what those ecological processes are and how they can help um, inform what we do in a permaculture design. So the first one is zonation. So um, each of them is a way of dividing the biological living things within an ecosystem. So they're a way of dividing them either by um, the area they occupy within that ecosystem, the heights that they occupy, or the, um, the changes that occur over time. So the first one, which is zonation, is the changes within a biological system. So the changes in what living things are in an ecosystem in different areas within that ecosystem. So when you look at two ecosystems um, that are joined together, so if you look at, say, a forest and a woodland, the species that are going to be on the edge of the forest are going to be different um, to the species that are within the middle of the forest. So that's what uh, zonation is. So if I draw a little diagram here on the forest, the species that are right in the heart of the forest are adapted to quite different conditions. They are sheltered by the trees in the forest. There's less light um, within the tree canopy. Um, there's less wind. It's a, it's a more kind of humid, protected, sheltered environment. And there's going to be quite different species adapted to that. And they're normally um, quite specialised. They're, they're normally niche, specialised species um, that would live within that. And the further you get out to the edge of the forest, there's going to be successive changes within the species that occupy those zones. So in this forest, for example, you might have another zone of species that are um, a little bit closer to the edge, so they're, they're more specialised to living in the forest, but they're not edge species as such. So they would be in that area there. And then uh, right on the edge of the forest, you'd have more the edge species. So the edge species are more adapted to a variety of conditions. So as things change, as they do on the edge of systems, they are more able to respond to those changes. And they tend to be a generalist type species, so um, weeds and pest species are all generalist type species because they're very adaptable and they can live in quite a variety of, of situations. And, and interestingly enough too, many of our agricultural species are all each species of forests or, or woodland environments. So they're quite adaptable to a, a wide range of different environments, which is handy if you want to grow them. So. Um, so yeah, the edge species are on the edge of the forest, and then the further you go within the forest, the more specialised those um, living things become to the particular um, abiotic factors um, within that ecosystem. And the same within the woodland. Um, a woodland tends to be a bit more diverse, but you, you would have, again, species that are um, specialised to living within that woodland, and then the closer to a different ecosystem like a, a forest, um, the more variable those species become. And, and humans have evolved in this kind of environment, this kind of edge woodland forest species, uh, edge woodland forest um, habitat um, is where we've, we've thought to evolve from, which is um, maybe an explanation of why we're so adaptable and, and varied and, and how we can do things. Um, so another explanation might be the beach. So if you're looking at a, a uh, the Ocean, the, the, the rock pool habitat that's on the edge of the ocean between the beach. Again, you can make different zones in here because you're going to get different species that are exposed when it's low tide on the edge of the beach to those that are co continuously submerged in water or adapted to living in rocky environments or even um, deeper as the ocean gets deeper. So again, you can have Uh, changes in the species that occupy these different zones, um, depending on, on their proximity to the beach or how deep within the ocean they get. So that's the first pattern, that's zonation, that's a way of um, organising li living things within an ecosystem by the area they occupy. And when two systems are in close proximity, the species that occupy the location between the two areas will be the edge species and they'll be different to the ones that are uh, deeper within it. 
Stratification is another way that biological systems organize themselves, and this one is a pattern depending on the heights in which they occupy. So it's commonly applied to a forest because when you look in a forest, the species that occur right on the tops of the um, trees are quite different to the species that um, exist lower down in the forest, depending on uh, changes in abiotic factors. So you've got less light the further down you go. So the plants have adapted different characteristics to photosynthesize and produce their own foods depending on their location within that forest. So you've got the big canopy trees right up the top that get um, spread out and, and capture all the sunlight and dominate that ecosystem. And then the rest of the plants are assembling themselves in response to that dominant um, canopy tree. So you've got a sub canopy tree that is um, at a lower height, um, depending on if there's uh, space in, in the canopy layer. And you've got a shrub layer, and you've got a ground cover layer, and you've got a, a vine layer. And that will vary, you know, depending on if that um, assemblage is at the edge of a forest to deeper within the forest. So at the edge, you'd get the full expression of all those different layers because there's sunlight getting um, to those different layers. But then deeper in the forest, you tend to have a more open um, space because the canopy trees dominate that ecosystem so much and let so little light come in. But when you um, kind of represent the generic uh, expression of this stratification layer, we look at having this big canopy tree. And then you've got the subcanopy tree below that. And then you've got a, a shrub layer, which is a, a lower height again. And then the ground cover, which is um, it could be underneath the trees in the sub canopy or, or on the edge um, beyond the shrub layer. So this is ground cover. So um, what this pattern represents in ecology is just a way of looking at the biological systems and categorizing them um, by height, and it's just a way that we can make sense of some of the diversity that's within those biological systems. And the, the application of this to the permaculture design is that if we want to create a system where we're making most productivity from a particular area, we can replicate our design and our composition of species based on this multi-layered canopy. So if you imagine a particular area of, of ground and we want to plant something on it and through the process of photosynthesis whatever we plant is going to produce a product for us and if we've got multiple layers of plants within that system we'll also have multiple layers of photosynthetic plants producing a product for us so we've got the canopy tree which might be a nut or a fruit tree producing that yield we've got a sub canopy tree which might be a fruit tree on a dwarf rootstock uh, which would keep it nice and small and that's producing another yield. We might have berry shrubs for the shrub layer. The ground cover could be a variety of uh, perennial vegetables or herbs. And we've also got vines, so you can make use of the characteristic of vines to trellis up trees. And increasingly too we're making use of mushrooms, so mushrooms you can incorporate into this system and you can grow them on an inoculated log commonly and by stacking all of these productive systems on top of each other we can maximize the productivity of a particular space and they'll also help um, work in with each other so they're helping to create a mutually beneficial environment because each one of these plants will have adapted certain characteristics to um, adapt to that particular site and the other plants would have um, evolved in response to that and when they are combined together they create a plant guild which is mutually compatible so they perform different beneficial functions in the soil and in support of each other and sheltering each other that is of benefit to all of them. So it not only helps with productivity but it also helps with um, benefiting each of those plants so that each one becomes more stable, not necessarily more productive, but more stable because it's being protected by these other species. And also you've got more variety in your production, so you've got a, a greater diversity in your yield. So that's how we can make use of stratification 
to um, enhance and diversify our agricultural production systems used in a, in a permaculture design. Okay, the final ecological process I want to have a look at is succession. So succession is when you get a change in the biological composition of an ecosystem over time. So when you look at a particular system, there will be different species that will occupy it over time. And if you take that to the extreme, so if you take a, a bare dirt site like what occurred on early earth, you get um, pioneer species coming in, so initially you get things that can survive in conditions where there's very little soil and, and life within that system. So you get um, algae, you get lichens, you get very simple bacteria, um, and you can get some insects kind of occupying that site. And the interaction of these very early pioneer species helps um, transform the environment and enrich the environment in a way that allows more complex life to come along and, and take over those, those simpler life forms. So that succession is, is the movement within an ecosystem from, from a state of simplicity with, with pioneer species that are very adaptable and, and hardy and resilient. Um, but as they change the environment and make it richer uh, and more diverse, then later more specialised species can evolve and, and occupy that site and, and occupy, occupy the position in that site. So um, the general application of that is in a forest. So when we clear away our own forests and we, we plant our agricultural systems, you, you see the expression of pioneer species, which are like weeds, occupy those sites and they're helping to stabilize the soil and, and heal the landscape in a way that will allow that forest to regrow itself within that site. So, um, so if you have a look at within a, in a forest system, you, you generally have a, a quite defined progression of species that occupy that site. So you've got um, your weeds generally, and they can be ones with big tap roots or fine net roots and the deep tap-rooted plants are, are there to draw up the minerals and nutrients from the soil. And when it's been disturbed, they might be in quite short supply. So they've adapted the ability to survive in that site by, by tapping the nutrients from deeper down within the subsoil. And then you've got the hair net weed type species that are trying to stabilize the soil that is left there. And the combination of those two, as well as nitrogen fixating plants and and small kind of resilient shrubs helps um, stabilize and, and diversify that system. And then as that system matures, you move more towards the forest edge um, species that are um, like edge species that are more adaptable to, to diverse conditions. So a lot of our agricultural species come from that, which are like woodland type species. And as that systems matured, the soil biology builds up, there's more fungi in that soil, then you get the trees starting to occupy that site and the development of that forest as it matures. So that's, that's the kind of predictable um, pattern of succession. In our agricultural systems, it's a really interesting pattern to make use of because we've taken those agricultural systems um, quite back as far as um, successional stages go to a grass system, which is very an early, successional stage system. So if uh, we look at that system, we can predict that it's going to change in certain ways over time as weeds and shrubs and then trees will start to occupy that site. So as a designer, we can predict that change in the sequence of plants and um, tie in our own management in response to that. So we might want to keep the system as a grassland, woodland type system and with the knowledge that it's going to change towards more of a forest system, we will then want to manage the, um, put in place procedures that will manage that succession. So we need to be able to graze back or, or mow back the plants that will otherwise take over that system. So that becomes a way of, of organizing and managing the elements within your system. So if you've got a planting of, of uh, nut trees or fruit trees within your pasture system, and you want to hold back that system in a mixed successional stage, you can prune back those trees and feed them to your livestock or mulch it and return it to the trees. Um, if you want to maintain the grass in between those plantings, which would otherwise be occupied by weeds and shrubs and things, you can bring in those grazers to graze back those pioneer species and return it to a grass system. So you want to 
be aware of how the system's going to be changing in nature and then, and then match your management to that um, progression. Uh, there's a couple of other interesting things I was thinking of. Um, so there's, there's two kind of contexts to succession that are kind of interesting. One is within a particular ecosystem, so that how that particular ecosystem is changing over time, but also in the larger context of life on Earth. If you kind of think about how life systems have changed on Earth over time, you get a similar change in biological systems. So if you look at a particular ecosystem, it, you get simple, pioneer, really resilient systems, uh, species coming in and making it more diverse and stable and fertile for a greater diversity and abundance of species to occupy that ecosystem. But if you look at biological life on Earth, you get this similar pattern emerging. So right back on the early stages of Earth, you've got very resilient, adaptable species um, starting to gain a foothold on biological systems on Earth. And as they improved the conditions and life started to stabilize the living systems that were on Earth, you get a greater diversity and abundance of, of life happening. And um, in this continuum, you get um, a constant series of disturbances. So these disturbances help bring back ecosystems to an earlier successional stage. And it's, it's happening all the time. You're always getting this kind of flux of ecosystems moving towards a state of stability. And then some disturbance, like a big storm or a flood or a drought happens, and it moves it back another way. And then the biological systems build up again and start to move it towards maturity. And then you get another disturbance again. And it's this constant flux within biological systems that is largely responsible for the continual evolution of those systems. Because if they just stayed in a state of stability, they wouldn't change well, they change very slowly and they wouldn't change much at all. So it's, uh, um, when you did get big disturbances to life on Earth, like big asteroids hitting at the time of the dinosaurs or big changes in ocean currents or big volcanic eruptions, um, all of these big uh, worldwide climatic events had a very big impact on life on Earth and they radically changed the course of evolution. So if it wasn't for... A, um, so when the meteorite hits Earth and wiped out the dinosaurs, for example, if that didn't happen, the evolution on Earth would have taken a very different direction. So the removal of dinosaurs opened up an opportunity for birds and mammals to evolve and, and diversify and take up all their different roles, which ultimately led to the evolution of us. Um, so it's, it's interesting to think about how the management of the complexity of ecolo ecological systems helps manage that diversity and abundance of those systems. And, and if we consider our, our own role within those systems, what role do we occupy? Because every species has its particular niche or its particular speciality. So it's kind of interesting to think about, you know, with humans, what niche do we fulfill in the broader context of, of life on Earth as far as how we manage systems and, and change them? Um, and ultimately, you know, all species improve their systems to some extent and, and tie in with the other life systems on Earth to create a state of, of more stability and, and more complex life on Earth. So it's a way of kind of recognising our role and our creativity and our intelligence and, and matching it in with our own role and looking at, you know, what, what kind of role we can play on Earth and how can we help um, stabilise and diversify and and enrich the life on Earth. And that's kind of ultimately maybe the, the role we, we can occupy um, on Earth.